Good morning, and uh, God's wisdom is, leads us to worship and his call for us to join together in community to share his word and praise this morning. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Um, Wednesday is coffee chat. Everyone is welcome. It's at 10 a.m. And we have um, Catherine Reisinger coming to speak on birds. It's a passion of hers. And uh, she is from our sister church in uh, Carluc, from St. Paul's. So we look forward to seeing her and uh, sharing coffee time and, and uh, her words of wisdom of birds. And next Sunday, I want you all to note it's uh, quite a different change for us. Uh, we are, there will not be 11 a.m. service. We will have a 4 p.m. service uh, as we uh, travel in Lent. And we will have a pancake uh, supper afterwards. So you're all welcome. And uh, those that are home that, that are sharing on YouTube this morning, uh, make a note. And, and maybe 4 p.m. is a good time for you to come and share with us next week. So if you have any questions, just uh, see Nancy or one of the elders afterwards. Uh, session for session members this, uh, no, it's not Monday, it's March the 6th. I, I, that short week is getting me, so you can note that, March 6th for the elders. And what, Bill has a uh, little message to uh, discuss this morning. Good morning. Um, it's been the wishes of session that we help out people that use our facilities. So in conversation with the other organizations that use our church, we're going to put in a little bit of a food pantry in the basement to help people that use our church that are having a little bit of a hard time. So the mission team will, is going to stock this to begin with, but if you wish to contribute, we'll have, our, have a cupboard downstairs in, with stocked with soup, pasta, tomato sauce, stuff that people can re readily use. We're not looking to take over the food bank's job. It's just to help people that are having a little bit of a hard time. There's a lot of people coming through our facility now, more and more all the time. Not everybody's as fortunate as a lot of us, so we're just trying to help them out. So as I say, if you want to contribute, let myself know or Pat know or Brian know. The mission team is going to be sort of heading this up. And if you know someone in our congregation or the other organizations using our church that are having a little bit of a hard time, tell them that, that it's available to them. This is for our, the community of our church. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Let's come to worship and read along with me our, our call to worship. O oh God, you are a hiding place for us. You preserve us from trouble. Let the faithful offer prayer and praise to God, for in times of distress, God is with us. The Lord will teach us the way we should go. God's steadfast love always surrounds us. So let us be glad in the Lord and rejoice in worship. We will sing for joy with praise of praise. Let's stand and, and sing song of praise as we sing ancient words. God, our creator and friend, your love is as fresh as a new day, rising like the sun to guide us. In Jesus Christ, you walk with us to challenge and encourage us, revealing our weaknesses while offering us hope. We praise you with honor and glory in this time of worship, open us to new possibilities. Create in us a new heart. With the power of the Holy Spirit, energize us to embrace the future, trusting in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's continue to praise God as he, we reveal King, the King of our heart, Jesus Christ. come to this part of our service where we give thanks for our blessings and uh, present our offerings. Uh, those at home watching on YouTube have um, discovered all the technical ways that you can uh, 
send in your offerings and gifts to Knox and uh, those here. Uh, we have a basket at the front so that you can casually uh, put any gifts you might offer today there. So let us give thanks for our abundance. God has given us so many gifts in Christ and in creation. We offer our gifts in gratitude for the possibilities we enjoy, trusting God to multiply what we bring for goodness sake. Lord God, we offer our gifts in thanksgiving for all the goodness you provide. Bless our gifts and our lives so that we become a source of goodness for others. In the name of Christ, our strength and our hope. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Life is good, isn't it? Yeah. I, uh, I, I realized that while I was gone, um, my favorite mic disappeared. Um, so we just bless those who like to steal. And um, I just want to say that that means it's going to be really hard for me to stay in front of the microphone. Because, um, yeah, take it. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, um, it's all good. You know, there's nothing that can take away our worship, that can take away our praise, and so we're thankful um, that we were able to get most things up and running, including our recording. And uh, yeah, we just we just bless those um, who have a hole in their life that they needed to fill, and uh, whatever that looks like for them. And uh, we pray grace on them. Um, This past week was Ash Wednesday. Anybody notice? How many of you gave up something for Ash Wednesday? For Lent? Anybody? Yeah? Yeah? I haven't really thought about it? No? What kind of things would you give up if you needed to? Was there anything? How about for some of the kids? Anything you would give up? No? You wouldn't give up anything? What's your favorite thing in the whole world? Do you have a game? Bryn? Pardon? All your animals. Okay. So I'm going to come up with a truck, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to borrow your animals for a few weeks. How would you feel about that? <laughs> oh, yeah, Easter's coming. Are you doing your rented chicken again? That's so awesome. Yeah, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't want us to take them away right now. But how hard is it to give up something? I guess one of the questions this morning is, why do we give up something for Lent? What's the idea behind it? Some kind of sacrifice? Pardon me? It's a reminder? Okay. A refocusing? So when we say things like, I'll give up chocolate, are we reminding, refocusing? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes is the right answer. But why? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. To lose weight? The question is, are we doing it for the right reasons, right? And so something to consider uh, as we move into... Um, our, our message for today. In the, in the meantime, um, I'd love to pray with you. If there is anything that we might share, a testimony of joy or of a concern that we can lift up to God this morning. Remind me of her name, Diane. Katie. Katie was dealing with cancer at age 40, and, and others, of course, that deal with those kind of. Any others? Okay. Oh, there you go. Salmon birthday celebrations, among others. Let's come to our God in prayer. Jesus, we recognize this morning that as we enter the Lent season, 
that our desire is to have our hearts and our minds on you. We just thank you so much for who you are in our life and for your incredible grace. And, you know, we just sang it. You are good. And there are so many things in our weeks, in our uh, in the week past, in our lives day by day that try to steal away seeing your goodness. And so we thank you for this time to pause to worship and just to refocus on you once again and, and remind us and open our eyes, Lord, to where your goodness dwells. We see that in daily miracles. Just the way the, the weather comes, the sun comes up every day and sets every evening. The changing of the seasons, Lord, this consistency and just the way it all works together and gravity and beauty all providing us life. We thank you. We see your miracle in the way that you give people such incredible knowledge to build things, to create things, knowledge um, for medical care. And Lord, we're so grateful, all of us at some time or another have had to see a doctor and have benefited from uh, advances in medicine and technology that give us life and health. We thank you for that. There are other incidences, Lord, in terms of health where doctors can only go so far. And so this morning we want to pray especially for Kate as she wrestles with uh, cancer diagnosis. And Lord, there are many others who not only have cancer, but chronic illness, chronic pain, um, so many, so many things. And Father, sometimes all medicine can do is manage. And so we pray, Lord Jesus, because you are the God that we can come to and entrust ourselves to, that you would lay your hand upon them and bring healing. And above all, Father, we ask that through whatever struggles um, people are going through, that your presence would be made very real to them, that they may know that you are their God and that they may live in hope and may have faith uh, to receive all that you have for them. Lord, we want to pray for our world. We're so grateful for our offering this morning, part of which is going to Presbyterian World Service and Development, where we have partners on the ground in Syria who are able to distribute um, shelter and food and medical assistance uh, to those suffering from the earthquake. And we're so grateful to be a part of that mission. And uh, Jesus, we just pray that you would um, just duplicate those gifts, not only for the physical needs, but also that people may feel your presence through them. We continue to pray for wars, and Lord, there are too many to list. And of course, there are the wars that are in the papers all the time, uh, but there are so many others, ethnic wars, wars against drugs, uh, gang wars, um, national wars. Father, we, we just can't comprehend that by now we still haven't learned that war brings us no further ahead. And so we pray for those displaced, suffering, those who are mourning the loss of loved ones as a result. And uh, Jesus, we, we keep our eyes and our hope on your kingdom. And um, we pray that the peace on earth that you have brought to us in Christ may be opened up to um, those who are leading, that they may see the way forward toward peace. Jesus, you know why each one of us is here today. You know the things that are on our hearts that we bring with us that have not been mentioned. And so we just offer all of that to you, and we just bless you and entrust you with the deepest things of our hearts. We pray, Father, that um, your word may speak to us this morning, and that we may 
go from here encouraged and strengthened in faith and in hope. Above all, may our lives, not only this morning but in the weeks ahead, reflect your glory and be an offering of service and praise to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Lori will take uh, the kids downstairs, and she has a story there for you. And we're going to have a look. We've been sitting in the book of Samuel for a little while. And uh, this morning we're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 8. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as the other nations have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all the people are saying to you, it is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now, listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel had heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. Then the Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. Then Samuel said to the Israelites, everyone go back to your own town. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, as we noted, we've just moved past Ash Wednesday where people <coughs> seek to give up something. And we might consider this morning, maybe not so much what we might give up, but maybe once a year it's good to reflect on what we have given up that maybe we shouldn't have. <coughs> Max Licato uh, writes a lot of stories, and he saw a survey, and so he created a, uh, a, a little story about it. And the story is like this. It's a game show, and it's called What's Your Price? And the idea is people are drawn, names drawn out of the crowd, and they come forward and they're asked, for $10 million, what is your price? What would you give up? And of course, the person doesn't really know, so they, they give them a little list. So you can put your children up for adoption, become a prostitute for a week, Give up your citizenship, abandon your church, 
abandon your family, kill a stranger, leave your spouse. What's your price? Well, I won't make you answer. Aren't I nice? Well, Max relates that a national survey says, in fact, 3% would give up their kids for adoption, 23 would be a prostitute for a week, 16% would give up their citizenship, 25% would give up their church, 25% would abandon their family, and 16% would give up their spouse. I'm not going to ask you what you were willing to give up. What's more surprising to me, because we would think, who, who could do any of those things? Um, but apparently, a lot of people would. And in fact, what is surprising is that people would readily compromise their morality, their family, um, give up reconciling maybe those differences with family that so readily says, I'll chuck it, um, and give up their faith for $10 million. It shocks me, and, and yet it really shouldn't shock us because there's nothing new under the sun, says Ecclesiastes. And when we look at our story and what we've been learning in Samuel and the book of Judges is we've learned there's just a mess of people and in the leadership all over Israel. Things are broken down. Humanity, it seems, is always seeking what's best for themselves. Now, a, a grammar teacher was uh, talking to her young students and asked them to grammatically identify certain parts of speech, and she gave them the words I and mine and asked them to grammatically um, name those parts of speech. And all the kids were silent. And finally, one child raised their hand and said, are they aggressive pronouns? I thought that was a rather interesting response. You see, when there's $10 million on the line, the I and me and the want of mine almost always takes over in our lives, doesn't it? The question is, what price would we pay to satisfy the I and me and the mine of the want? It's always there. And what I find interesting, and maybe you didn't pick up on it, one of the options was, would you kill a stranger? And nobody said they would. They would, they would leave their family and their faith and their church out to dry, but they would not kill a stranger. Now, why do you think that is? You would end up in jail. The I and me and the mind of want would not want to suffer the consequences. None of the other ones necessarily have legal consequences. This nearsighted desire for immediate satisfaction is what seems to be happening here in 1 Samuel chapter 8. Israel's top leaders storm in on Samuel and they're demanding a king. We want it now. We want to look like everyone else. We want someone to take care of our enemies. We want a king. And as we read, it's very clear the consequences that that's going to cost Israel. Their sons are going to be drafted and taken away, as are their daughters. They're going to become servants of the king. They, they, in a sense, their free will will be taken. They'll be forced into service of the king. He's going to confiscate your land. He's going to tax you on all of your crops. Ultimately, this monarchy is going to take, take, and keep on taking. What is it that Israel has now that they're willing to give up? You see, they're, they're taking a radical departure from a social, equitable, just system that the Lord instituted and giving it up to have one ruler. They're moving away from the Lord who orchestrated his nation to, to work graciously and equally with all. If, if we think of Sabbath days, Sabbath 
years, the year of Jubilee. It was like if you had a servant after certain Sabbaths, you would have to release them. If you had debt, you would have to re, um, forgive that debt. That's all being given up when they ask for a king. They're moving away from a social organization in which the elders would hear from the people. It sounds very Presbyterian. The elders would hear from the people. They would discern together. They would take it to the higher court. They would take it to the next court. So it's a, it's a grassroots leadership going up under the Lord's will and desire rather than a monarchy in which one person says, you're going to do this and this and this and this, and you're going to obey me. What Israel is doing in asking for a king is that they're giving up their unique identity as a set-apart people and a set-apart nation. They, they just want to blend in with the current culture, with the rest of society. They, they're asking for a king, and, and along with that, what we see is this whole 500 years of downhill after they get a king. They start worshiping other gods. The, the kings are looking for political gain. They no longer have the whole nation's interest in mind. In fact, you know, you get Saul, you get David, and then by the third king, Solomon, the whole nation is split in two. I like that guy, or I like that guy. They want power. But in our story, desiring a monarchy is a theological or a faith-oriented problem rather than a political one. They're rejecting God. They're saying, we don't need God. We want a human to represent us. Yahweh is the rule of, of the source of life, of, of the ruler of them. They, they don't want it. They just don't feel it's done enough. They want a God that they can see. As I read that story and reflect, what might be the price that I might pay or that you might pay for what we want? What might we give up or might we have already given up? So sure, on, on Ash Wednesday, we give up something that we really love for, for sacrifice, for the idea of drawing closer to God. And maybe I wonder if we give up social media to give our brains a break, or we give up chocolate to lose weight, or alcohol to prove that we're not addicted, or you know, stop going for fast food to save money. I say entering... Lent is a good annual time for us to consider what attitudes, behaviors, habits that we've picked up over the past year or even those things that we've let fall by the wayside. Those things that have left us less than holy people, less than being the light to this dark world. The whole story makes me painfully aware, and yet I notice a very merciful thing. The merciful thing is that God is gracious. He, he says to Israel, I entrust you to your free will. You want a king? I'll, I'll let you have a king. In fact, God even picks the king out for them. He doesn't go against what our first desire is. He gives us room to maybe take the long way to surrender to him. God serves the people through the king. They benefit to some degree. And through it, other kings come. I mean, King David is noted the greatest one, although he fails left and right. But it is through that chain of King David that we have the genealogy beginning of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And, and God, God says he's going to work through that. He's gracious even when we reject him. Well, why must we be painfully aware? Because we do have free will. 
and we can make choices that lead us away. We can choose to busy ourselves to such an extent that we say, yeah, I really, I really should connect with God more. I, I really should worship, or, you know, I really should uh, reconcile those relationships someday. And God says, yeah, someday, sooner than later might be good. But I'll wait until you're ready. Given half a chance, we would all reject God, wouldn't we? And we have. We, we want to blend in. We want to be a part of culture. We want to be like everybody else. We want our free will. And we're not always happy when God allows it, as Israel soon discovered that choosing the king actually cost them an awful lot. A lot of sons were lost in war. A lot of daughters taken as concubines and servants. A lot of taxes. Anyone getting ready to file theirs? Are you excited? You see, there's, there's many subtle choices that we make day by day that lead us further and further away from Jesus as our King of Kings, as our source of life. Maybe it's a good time to consider as we go through Lent, not so much that we give up something, but consider what we may have already given up that has drawn us further away from spending time with God or to have him speak into our lives where we so readily pray, thy will be done, but then we don't want to do it. In the New Testament, we read about how the teachers of the law exchanged the grace of the Ten Commandments. So the Ten Commandments are a grace. Love the Lord your God and your neighbor as yourself. But the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law started to, um, to create their own rules. Oh, no, carrying a mat on Sunday. No, you can't, you can't do that. Or you've got to wash your hands at certain times in certain ways. And Jesus says, you know... You've exchanged the commands so that you can hold on tightly to your man-made rules. They moved themselves, the Pharisees, and led others further and further away from God's protection, and God let them do it. He wasn't going to come down like a parent and, and, and force them to do certain things. You know, like any parent, you give your children space sometimes to go the wrong way so that they learn, so that they might repent and turn back. These false teachings led the people to one day cry out, crucify him. And that they rejected Jesus as their king of kings in a way that we can't even imagine and yet at the same time know that if we were caught up in the crowd and the culture, we would have done the same thing. Here again, we're painfully aware of God's graciousness, that he let it happen, and he willingly let it happen. Where Christ gave up his own life and led us to victory and forgiveness and wholeness. It's a profound act of grace that God sets toward the path of salvation for all, even for those who reject him can reach that salvation. Well, as we move into the Lent season, what price might we pay to satisfy the I in me and the mine of want? What might we have given up that we shouldn't have and that maybe we should pick up again this Lent season? How might we reflect on what it takes to get back to having Christ as king of our lives. Let's consider that as we pray. Heavenly Father, even now your, your spirit is working in us and we realize there are so many things that we just haven't put our energy into that maybe we should have. And there are so many things that we put energy into that we shouldn't have. And so in this season of Lent, this, 
this breath before we move toward Good Friday. We pray that your Holy Spirit may come and rejuvenate our hearts. Provide for us a Sabbath, Lord, where we can let go of things, where we can pick up your burden, which you promise is light, and get rid of burdens that are destructive and harmful in our lives. Holy Spirit, would you position our hearts and our minds and our wills to receive from you this Easter season? In all things, Father, we recognize our free will and, and we're so grateful for it. For the ability to discern and make choices and to know that even when we fail, you are there readily drawing us back to you. And so we rest in the goodness of God. We rest in your peace. And we pray, Lord, that as we offer our lives, that they may indeed be a sacrifice of praise to your glory. Amen. As we continue to allow the Holy Spirit to work in us, let's respond by singing, Guide Me, O Great Jehovah. It's an older song, uh, but it's an uh, invitation of prayer to invite the Spirit in to guide us. God, open your hearts and receive God's blessing as he calls you as King and Lord to work in your life, to go out and serve and love others in his name. And as you do so, may the love of God and the joy of Christ and the guidance of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>